I'm pleased to have today on Substance a very special guest, Lisa Hook, CEO and President of Newstar. So Lisa, it's so exciting to be here with you and talk to you about what's going on uh, over at Newstar and with yourself and all the fun, exciting things that are happening. So thank you for joining me here today. Thanks for having me. I'm really excited to be here. Thank you. Thank you. Me too. So um, why don't we go ahead and get started? Sounds good. How did you take a traditional telecommunications company and turn it into an information services business? So the DNA around performing services flawlessly comes out of the telecommunications industry. Our background in being the brains of the telecom network means that we have to be neutral, we have to be extremely fastidious with data, mm. we've never had a breach, we are hyper concerned with privacy, people take privacy tests once a quarter. So mm. all of that um, DNA around hyper scalable, hyper reliable, hyper private systems mm -hmm. is phenomenally useful and actually quite differentiated from any other company in information services. Um, what's held us back, and it holds every company back mm -hmm. in the transformation is, change is really scary, mm -hmm. even good change is scary, and so you have to over-communicate why change is good, why this is, why we're all going to move into the future together, but you know, that's really, I think, where we need to, where we have focused a lot of time, but we need to focus more time is on pulling people along, getting more velocity against, against the transformation. I want to talk to you a little bit about that, about the em employee infrastructure and how do you move, motivate, and, and create an environment that, that does that. But mm -hmm. uh, let's get to that in just a second, because before we do that, let's stay with the, the data privacy aspect. Yep. Um, this, the privacy uh, aspect, especially that you have over personalization right now. Um, and I know you guys are heavily involved in personalization. Um, how do you take data and actually personalize it without being creepy and especially without uh, you know data mining to the point where you're going to especially creep someone out. Um, but where does that live on a security level? How do you how do you protect people? So the first thing we do is we atomize the data and we store it in silos. So if you miraculously were able to break into the company and steal one of our data sets, all you would be stealing would be, for instance, a data set of women's first names mm. or a data set of men's first names or men's last names. So the data are atomized into the lowest common unit. Names, addresses are fragmented, numbers are fragmented, et cetera. Mm. Behavioral propensities are fragmented. And then the only thing that would exist with respect to you would be a small container of pointers that if the container of pointers were stolen would point to nothing. Mm. So we've created um, a structure for the data that makes it uninteresting to break into. So that's the mm. lowest. And then of course, um, like every other company, we've got a variety of protections and scanners and all sorts of you know mission impossible stuff going on that mm -hmm both looks great and works well. We continually worry about security as every company should. And then as I said, on top of that, we're really, really focused on what's called the human firewall. Mm. Um, so every one of our 1500 employees at the beginning of the day, and then as I said, every quarter is retrained on the use of data, um, using your business judgment. If you're creating a product and it's a product that would creep you out, yeah. don't create that product. So yeah. it's both training on protection and training on using business judgment. And to date, um, in the product design, that, that's worked extremely well for us. The way we use the authoritative identity framework when it is composed is very different depending on the use case. So in a marketing environment, for the most part, our clients don't really care that it's Lisa Hook. We don't sell them that information. Mm -hmm. What our clients want to know is, I have this person navigating to my website, I have this person calling my call center, what should I be talking to them about? Mm -hmm. You know, What should I be selling them? Which line should I be putting them into? How should I care for them? So instead of providing the identity data itself, 
we anonymize that, we map it to certain needs of the client, and then what we provide to the client is the interaction or the actionable insight. Here's what you should be saying to this person when she calls. Here's what you should be presenting to this person when she navigates, right? Not, oh my goodness, it's Lisa Hook. We do that from gathering from a variety of authoritative sources, core identity data, and then we take a lot of information that's been developed over the last 40 years for direct mail, which has always been used in an offline envir environment and is equally useful in an online environment. So am I more likely than the average American to shop at Bergdorf Goodman? Am I more likely than the average American to shop at Walmart, mm -hmm. to buy branded orange juice, that kind of thing? Mm -hmm. We don't track people's behavior online. Mm -hmm. And I know many people think that that's valuable, but I can tell you that all recommendation engines for me are wrong mm -hmm. because the only thing I do online is buy gifts for my sons. Mm -hmm. So I am continually getting recommended fishing trips in the Amazon, right. which I would never in a million years want to take. Mm -hmm. So we basically marry offline and online mm -hmm. to get to what we hope will be a delightful transaction for our customers and their end users. Mm -hmm. In the risk and fraud environment, it's different. So there's a law that prohibits companies from calling you unless you've given them permission. You give your credit card company permission when you sign up for the credit card, you give them that phone number, five or six years later that phone number m may belong to somebody else. Mm -hmm. If they call that phone number and it's someone else, they pay a statutory fine. Mm -hmm. So in that case, they need to know that that phone number no longer belongs to you, mm -hmm. Brian, right? Mm -hmm. So there your identity is more important. You want to be protected from risk and fraud, mm -hmm. and therefore who you are is quite relevant. Yeah. In the security environment, again, nobody cares that it's Lisa Hook. What they care about is, is it Lisa Hook or Lisa Hook's computer who are attacking us right now with a denial of service or other type of attack? So there, there the identity is more, is this a bad actor? Is this bad behavior that we should stop or mm -hmm. control? Not who yeah. am I as a person? So again, while we have an identity framework, we're actually quite uh, controlled about the use of it for different use cases. Mm -hmm. And then it's just an input to what our clients really want, mm -hmm. which is not, it's Lisa and she's 5'7". Right. It's, what am I selling this person? How do you manage a, a company through change and do that at scale? And, and still solve all these different problems. Um, looking at all these all the employees and saying, hey, here's this is good for us, we mm -hmm. need to go do this. It's been a combination of having people who are extraordinarily skilled and mission driven with respect to the services and being incredibly fortunate to be able to attract new talent into the business who are natives to the information services industry. So today on my senior team, I have about 70% of the folks have come since we've started this transition. 30% mm. of the folks have been here prior to and carrying on the institutional knowledge. Mm -hmm. But it's the great fortune of the mix of voices and the mix of talents. And then frankly, having a senior team that is dramatically better at communicating than I am. So it's not me, it's really, unbelievable luck at attracting an extraordinary group of people. Mm. That's always uh, good when you have a good team behind you to be able to, to do uh, what you what you need to. What, Look, um, every smart CEO should realize that they're a C student and should go out and hire A students. Mm. And we've got A plus students from the best companies in the planet. What is an A student? An A student is somebody who is creative, uh, takes ownership and accountability, can drive the business forward in ways that I could never imagine. That's the most exciting part is, you know, having come up with this <clears throat> crazy escapade of, idea, of an idea to move from Detroit to the Hamptons, to move from telecom services to information services, to move from a, a slow growing industry to an industry that's growing double digits. Mm -hmm. That was just an idea, but being able to bring on these people who can flesh out the idea and tell the story mm -hmm. and tell the story and create the reality in ways that I could never dream, mm -hmm. it's like breathing pure oxygen. Mm. Wow. 
How, so how you were a part of the Carter administration. Yes, I was an intern in the Carter White House. So, wow. Back when interns were really interns. <laughs> <laughs> um, so so <coughs> how are you using today the skill sets that you gained and how do you, uh, how do, how, what did you learn from that that you're using today? So I was there as a junior in college for the summer and then a semester. Mm. I was managing student press and out of town press in under um, uh, Carter. And really I, I only began there to start to have any sort of executive function. I mean, I think women are better than guys in college with executive function, but they're still not particularly organized. So mm. honestly, it was learning how to be organized, learning how to show up, learning how to be accountable, um, learning how to creatively problem solve, because I was left on my own with a lot of these programs. Even as an intern? Even as an intern. Really? I mean, you know, they weren't, pr they, they didn't have enough hands to go around for everything that they were doing. Um, I was there at the beginning of the hostage crisis for the Pope's visit. So there were just an incredible number of really interesting once in a lifetime experiences. I actually went because I was interested in the First Amendment and continue to be. I really think that we sort of through an authoritative identity framework and providing proper conversations with people can can push that free speech forward and push correct and appropriate speech forward. So it's it's what I'm doing today is really quite related to to mm -hmm. my core interests at the beginning of the day. When you piece all of these things together and you look at all of that, what do you think is the one thing that contributes to now changing this? What helped you do that? Well, when you listen to that crazy background, yeah. it means that I have no skills <laughs> for what I'm doing, which is why I, I, I need to have people around me who actually know what they're doing. And mm -hmm. I think that's the most important thing is just realizing that I've landed in this incredibly mm -hmm. fortunate position and I better damn well have people who are smarter and mm -hmm. information services natives come and you know keep me from stepping in it. Well, let's. So um, that's an interesting thing because um, uh, one of the roles that I wanted to talk to you about was the CIO and CMO role mm -hmm. and how people are um, seeing those roles and how that role is changing. Um, the technology role is becoming more and more important to the CMO mm -hmm. and vice versa. Um, how do you see the lines being blurred and how do you see those two roles working moving forward? The reason we're focused on the CMO and the marketing department is that we think there's an extraordinary opportunity to help them organize technology and to push it back down. And by that I mean CMOs today are getting inundated by companies saying, I have a data set of every single person who lives within 100 feet of a fire hydrant. I'm not making this up. I have a data set of every person with a dog. I ha you know, so there are thousands of companies selling these micro data sets. And then on top of that, you have thousands of companies selling very tiny particularized analytics packages. Mm -hmm. Those are all interesting, but as a CMO, having to sit and sort through and compare data sets and then tools and then put them all together makes absolutely no sense. Mm -hmm. As a CMO, you want to get more customers, delight your existing customers, right. think creatively, come up with new offers, not be sitting in the back office with a Lego set trying to put it all together. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's probably inappropriate to refer back to my four years at AOL, but I think the one thing AOL did brilliantly was to make technology invisible. So easy to use, no wonder it's number one. You know, nobody knew they were on the internet. Mm -hmm. um, and the adoption rates were extreme. So we're really focused on putting together a suite of marketing services in a simple, easy to use environment that will allow the marketing department to look across all channels to manage their spend across all channels mm. for one simple, easy interface. And, and again, push technology down so they actually don't have to think about IT because to your point, mm -hmm. nobody really likes to think about IT. Mm -hmm. And then on the CIO side, 
those poor guys are just inundated with problems. Right. Data breaches, physical breaches, bring your own device, you name it. The move from owning your own servers, which makes every CIO feel safe, to cloud services, you can't see them, you can't touch them. That's a huge change for a CIO. And the e-commerce component of it really doesn't yet hit the number one spot for most CIOs. So our goal there is to help them understand in their language, what does the marketing department need from them? Mm -hmm. How can they perform to be the best customer experience partner mm -hmm. for the marketing department in language that the CIO speaks? Mm -hmm. No small feat to get a technology person and a marketing person together. I've actually um, heard s uh, different different titles around certain CMOs that actually come with an engineering background and certain engineering backgrounds that come, you know, in, in, in yep. the opposite. Um, do you think that that's viable, or do you think that the two really are um, two completely different positions and what they're doing? I think m we're only beginning to see the start of those conversations. There are some companies that are talking about moving a CIO into the marketing department that would report directly to the CMO wow. for e-commerce purposes. Other CIOs are looking at bringing more e-commerce uh, technology skills onto their team. Honestly, I think it's really too early to call mm. how organizationally this will work out, but it's not too early to know that the two have to be speaking to each other, have to work with each other against the goal of a delightful consumer experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so let's talk a little. Let's talk a little bit about um, your your um, excitement around STEM mm -hmm. um, and the future of STEM and where you see it going, especially with um, uh, women playing a role in STEM and. Where, how, how, how are you, where's your passion, where's your excitement around STEM? Well, you know, within the next couple of years, we're gonna have 1.6 million STEM jobs empty in this country. And we could quite easily fill those jobs if we could figure out how to get more women interested in STEM. When I graduated in from college, um, you know, back at the start of the world, 29% of STEM graduates were female. Today, 19% of STEM graduates are female. So instead of mm -hmm. increasing the number of women who are graduating with STEM degrees, it's been collapsing for mm -hmm. reasons, frankly, that I don't think we mm -hmm. quite understand. So, you know, I'm not sure that I can have a huge effect, but my view is that I should be very visible and the women in our company are very visible in terms of promoting STEM careers, both in our company going into middle schools, going into high schools, going into colleges, and just talking about how exciting the world of technology is. And frankly, it doesn't really matter what career you want to go into, it will be technology affected. Mm -hmm. And I think it's a real disservice to women to let them graduate without um, a facility around technology and, mm -hmm. and programming. So what excites you about technology? Oh my God, technology is everything. It, you can talk to an engineer and say, is this possible? And you know the answer is always yes. I mean, anything you can imagine is always possible and it's just that ability to think creatively mm -hmm. is so exciting, not just in what we're doing, but the breakthroughs in science of the brain, the breakthroughs in robotics, the breakthroughs in artificial intelligence, there's really not enough time in the day to get excited about all of these areas, but it's it's extraordinary. We're just at the beginning of you know really moving from the information age to the intelligence age, and I think it's wild. Man, I could not agree with you more. But I love that that answer. Isn't it? Yeah, it's, it's just insane. It's mind-boggling. Yeah. What what's coming? Yep. So you're going. You want to go. Uh, trash free. Mm -hmm. um, so how do you do that? How do you how do you completely go trash free? In stages. <laughs> so we've started with our San Francisco office. When we moved in, we made the decision to go to start going trash free and to get there by 2020. And it's not completely trash free because we have food waste. So basically, we're focused on um, reducing simply to compost. We recycle our computers. 
we don't have any bottles, cans, plastic, paper plates, uh, uh, plastic forks. We've given everybody Nalgene bottles. We have an old-fashioned soda machine, mm. which the engineers have already hacked because they could. How do you uh, hack a soda machine? Did they like transport? Oh my goodness, soda machines are some of the first machines on the Internet of Things. So our soda machine talks to its overlord regularly and tells it whether it needs more of this kind of syrup or that kind of syrup. Really? And you can make custom sodas on your computer and then download a barcode to your cell phone and put the barcode against the machine and it will make your custom soda. So it was, it's a computer. So what does one do with a computer? Hack it. So they've made now, I shouldn't be admitting this, I'm sure I'm going to get in some sort of licensing trouble, but they've made all sorts of unauthorized custom sodas and the machine says unauth unauthorized things to certain users. Wow. God only knows what it's going to be doing when I get back to the office, but yes, so we've got a talking, living soda machine. and real food and with respect to our printer we have one for 180 people mm. and it mostly doesn't have any paper mm. purely you, by accident but we're trying to habituate people to read and edit etc online rather than rather than using trees why the resistance why would people push back on that um, that's it's inconvenient like um, we have learned a lot about the way people were brought up whether they clean their own dishes, load the dishwasher, mm. unload the dishwasher. So we're all helping each other to develop new habits mm. inside the company. Well, good luck with that. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> See my dish pan hands. <laughs> That would be fun when uh, when you get there. I, I would yes. love to come see the uh, the soda machines. We'd love to have you up there and we promise it will only say nice things to you. Oh, good. <laughs> good. And the soda machine will say nice things to me as well, right? Absolutely. Good. Absolutely. Mm -hmm.